Hey Majka Mamas, my name is Sherry and I am one of the members of the social team here at Majka and um, I am also our affiliate manager so y'all have never really seen my face before but I am so excited to be here. Um, today we are going to be joined by Dr. Trill from Free to Feed and we are going to discuss all things food allergies, food sensitivities, um, but mainly with a focus on like a cow's milk allergy. So I'm gonna take a second here. Um, we're gonna get Dr. Trill on, but before I do, um, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. And um, for those of you who comment and engage, we'll be picking a few winners to send messages to. So ask your questions and let's get going. All right, we should be seeing Dr. Trill Hill here shortly. Hello, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? Good, Good. it's so wonderful to get to meet you in person. You and I have talked for years, but haven't actually gotten to meet, so it's wonderful to meet you. It's wonderful to meet you too. Um, can you just, we're gonna jump right in. Yeah. Can you just take a quick moment to do an introduction of yourself? Of course. So, so I am Dr. Trill Pollen. I am a molecular biologist and the founder of Free to Feed. Free to Feed helps parents navigate food allergies, and we do so by offering mostly research is our number one focus. Um, we have a grant and investor-funded research that's specific to understanding exactly how we transfer proteins from our diet to our breast. and how that can elicit allergic responses in some infants. So how can we support parents in order to provide them the resources and the research they need to continue their feeding journey and can allow them to reach their feeding goals, right? And so um, in a, addition to that, alongside this research that we've done, we have developed the very first test kit that allows parents to detect allergens in human milk in order to help parents be able to pinpoint exactly what's eliciting their child a response so that we're no longer going on that blind elimination diets. We can go on elimination diets that are specifically like really supported by data based on exactly what's in your breast at any given moment. So that's kind of a, an overview. There's there's a lot to unpack there, but I'm very excited to chat. That is absolutely incredible. I had no idea we were able to focus so much on the specific allergens and what a blessing for moms to be able to have that just information to move forward instead of just having to guess at what they need to eliminate. We can now know. Um, so I just had a quick question to start off with. Of, can you just quickly explain like what is a food allergy? Yeah, absolutely. So so when we're looking at a food allergen, so there's kind of different terms um, that I think is important is where we get started. Um, a food allergen is any portion of a food, of any portion of any food that can elicit an allergic response in a person. And what's interesting is that oftentimes, stereotypically, we think like of an allergy, an allergen, and we think like cow's milk, or we think soy or peanuts. Peanuts mm -hmm. is probably one of the first ones to come to mind. Yeah. Um, but in reality, any food can elicit a response in any person. And there are just certain foods that are more likely or less likely to be an allergen. And so those allergens then can cause an allergy. Okay. <laughs> and so what happens with an allergy is that the immune system is misidentifying that portion of the protein, that allergen, it's misidentifying it and seeing it as something that's bad, something that's trying to attack the body. When in reality, it's a benign substance, it's a food. Um, but unfortunately, for specific reasons to that person, the immune system sees that like section of a peanut, for example, and says, oh no, that looks a lot like a parasite to me. That looks a lot like a bacteria or a virus. I'm going to attack it. And so then we end up with an allergic response. And it's important to note too, especially with our audience, that there are two big categories for food allergies. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes when we think of a food allergy, we think of little Timmy having a peanut and going into anaphylactic mm -hmm. shock, needing an EpiPen and having to go to the hospital, right? right. Like that life-threatening food allergy. I have one of those. I have um, an EpiPen as well. And there's a whole other category though that just recently in 2017 got diagnostic codes in the US, which are called non-IgE mediated okay. food allergies, which is basically 
an awkward bucket for everything else. And so these are cellular responses where it's not an anaphylactic, life-threatening food allergy, but it's still the immune system misidentifying an allergen and eliciting an allergic response. So it's still an allergy. Okay. So the good news is that those types of responses are highly likely to be outgrown, like high 90 percentiles of kiddos who have a non-IG native food allergy will awesome. outgrow them. Hallelujah for that. Right? Yeah, great news. Um, great news, same for us. Like my, both of my daughters had severe non-IG mediated food allergies in, in, as infants, and today they can eat basically whatever they want. They have no food allergies. I'm the only one left in the house now that has food allergies. The irony here. Right. Um, however, the downside, so the plus side being they're going to outgrow it very likely, which is wonderful and amazing, exactly what we want to hear. The downside being that there are no tests for non ib mediated food allergies. So when we go to an allergist and get an allergy test, they're specifically testing for those IgEs that you see in anaphylactic shock and that life-threatening response. And we don't have any tests yet to tell us exactly what foods elicit any of the other big responses, these cellular responses. So that's kind of a what an allergen is, right? The food portion, what the response is, and then kind of what the two categories are. Most infants who have responses, a good vast majority of them have non-IG mediated food allergies. Okay. So I know like in the health world, we hear things about like food allergies and sensitivities. Is there a quick rundown, rundown on how we can distinguish like the difference between the two? Because I think sometimes we think, oh, a sensitivity is an allergen when I know that that's not exactly the case. Yeah. Yeah, so what's interesting is that technically, so the other like categories that we hear in the community sometimes is sensitivity and intolerance. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes, I think more than more than not, these terms are used because they can kind of um, placate or like play down what exactly is going on. And um, it's more than likely than not that the child has a non-IG mediated food allergy. Okay. But it's easier to tell a parent that it's just a sensitivity and they're gonna outgrow it, as opposed to like, really diving in, which the parent deserves, mm -hmm. really diving into this is what a non-IG mediated food allergy is, this is what it means, and this is how they're going to outgrow it. Instead, just being like, it's a sensitivity, don't worry about it, it'll be outgrown. Now, technically, a sensitivity is like um, a chemical or a certain um, metal or things like that that can like kind of elicit some kind of response that kind of bothers you, but it's not an immune allergic response, which is what most infants experience. Then the other category that I mentioned, the intolerances, also, unfortunately, a lot of babies get bucketed into this category because mm -hmm. stereotypically we think of intolerance as less than or like less awful right. instead of food allergy as well. When in reality, we actually want our baby to have a non ig mediated food allergy and not an intolerance. Mm -hmm. Because an intolerance technically is the inability to make an enzyme that breaks down a food. Okay. Just like when we're later on adults and we get a lactose intolerance, mm -hmm. like once you have that, you're not going to suddenly start making that enzyme again. You're, you're done making the proper amount of enzyme, and that's kind of your life now. Um, and typically, we think of it being less awful because we think of exactly that, right? right? Uncle Bob has a lactose intolerance. He eats ice cream anyway, and he's stuck in the bathroom. Yeah. So that's what we think of, which isn't nearly as scary as, like, an allergy mm -hmm. or what it seems like it. But it's actually very, very unlikely, like, it's incredibly rare, only a few cases in the world in the history of written um, case studies that uh, that babies are born with a true intolerance okay. where they're actually unable to make those enzymes to break down foods. And if they are, if they do have an intolerance, it's caught in the hospital because it's so severe. Oh, wow. Because the, that child will immediately go into failure to thrive. They won't be able to absorb any nutrients. So it's caught very early, right away in the hospital. There are a few rare cases in which that happens, and they are given medication and, and provided all the testing that they need for the rest of us um, that are navigating you know, a few weeks in, a few days in, um, where the symptoms are not fun, but they're not life threatening necessarily, where it's back into that non IgE mediated bucket. Okay. So then at what age or, you know, months, um, is it common for it to present specifically in newborns or are babies more three to four months down the age? Like what in your expertise do you see most of these allergies arising? Yeah, most often than not, when parents reach us, it's right in between um, month two and month three. So that's the most common time that we see it. 
And that can be really confusing for parents, right? Because you're like, I haven't changed anything about my diet. I, what, what could possibly be happening now? And so we assume that it can't be food, right? Because like you have, you're not doing anything new. Mm -hmm. But in reality, in the first few years of life, especially that immune system is continuously developing. And when the baby, up to the point where the baby was born, um, they were depending solely on your immune system, right? And so for some babies, we'll see it on day one. And those are um, not super uncommon. We're like, yep, on day one, I saw my baby projectiles across the room and we knew we were in this journey. Sometimes it also is that the baby is presenting with symptoms, but we don't catch it until a little bit later, right? We're like, I feel like something's wrong. Baby's spitting up a lot. They're really un unhappy. There's a thrash. But they just told me that it's like baby acne and the baby spit up and that like baby have colic. And so I just kind of got placated until finally I said at month three, no, okay, this isn't normal. This isn't getting any better. I want answers. Yeah. So I think a little bit of all the, the like short answer to um, my long tirade is that 80% of all food reactivity occurs in the first year of life. Okay. Technically, we can have a new food allergy anytime, right? Even now as adults, right. you or I could go eat salmon and now all of a sudden have a salmon allergy, which not, that's not fun. No, um, so not. technically anytime, but 80% of us will present with our food allergies within the first year. Okay. So then what signs and symptoms should we be on the lookout for for this? Yeah. So on the category of the IgE-mediated food mm -hmm. allergies, um, we're looking for things like hives. We're looking for um, any kind of swelling, things like that, any kind of breath restriction, any kind of heart palpitation issues, things of that accord. And usually, more often than not, like hives is like the first mm -hmm. thing that we'll see, hives or swelling. Um, and one thing to kind of help a little bit is that um, – the earlier that we have the first reaction for kiddos, usually the um, less severe that reaction is, if okay. that makes sense. Okay. So it's less likely to be as severe if the kiddo has their first peanut reaction at, you know, seven months old versus two years old, okay. as an example. So those are the symptoms to keep an eye out for as it, as it relates to those like lifelong, life-threatening food allergies. Now, the non ige mediated food allergies, they're super fun because because they're a bucket of many different types, right? There's allergic proctitis and FPIs and FBE. There's a whole slew of them, but I'm gonna go over the symptoms. Um, I'm not gonna dig into each individual, but know that we have a blog on that. Yes, more than happy to share. A wealth of resources. Lots of info. So the symptoms that you're looking for is externally um, rashes and eczema. And what's important to know about eczema is that it's a blanket term for like seven different types of rashes. Okay. So eczema can be flaky. It may just be red. There's a lots of different types. We also have pictures, galleries of um, eczema as well for parents. So that's what we're looking for externally. Internally for symptoms in the GI system, we'll see chronic congestion. We can see um, issues with swallowing. We can see reflux um, symptoms, silent reflux, vomiting responses, tummy trouble. And then on the back end, oftentimes we'll see diarrhea, constipation, excessively mucusy stool, mm -hmm. and bloody stool. Okay. Um, and then all of those things can cause secondary problems. So if you think about like you as a person, if you suddenly started vomiting a lot, you may have issues keeping your weight up right or gaining weight over time and so we may have babies with failure to thrive or if you had diarrhea all day every day you'd probably be upset about it mm -hmm. and tell everybody how upset you are so you may get you know diagnosed with colic at that point um, so there's lots of secondary issues another big one is if things that you ate caused you discomfort in your esophagus you may refuse to eat mm -hmm. and feeding refusal and feeding inversions is very common for these kiddos where they'll pop off their breast, they'll arc their back, and they'll tell you how much they are upset at you right now. And as somebody who's had a little, who also navigated feeding aversions, I have to say like of all of the terrifying symptoms, that one was one of the hardest ones to navigate as a lactating parent trying to like physically feed a hungry right. baby who also doesn't want anything to do with what you're giving them. Um, so there's lots of different symptoms. And the number one thing that I want parents to take away from that, like this laundry list of symptoms mm -hmm. is that it is very rare for a baby to have all of those symptoms. It's okay. super common for me to talk to parents and for them to say, yeah, we were told that our baby doesn't have blood in school, so it can't be an allergy. That's not the case. 
they absolutely can still have an allergy even if there's not blood in stool. That just means that that's not the location or the severity at which the reaction is occurring. Or we'll hear, well, my baby's a chunk, so they can't have a food allergy. That's not the case. We don't ever say that like someone can or cannot be diagnosed with something based on their ability to gain weight or lack thereof. Um, so there is no, unfortunately, and I wish there was, there is no like one symptom that is a catch-all to say like my baby doesn't have a food allergy or that my baby does. And it's more often than not that we'll have a couple and of these symptoms than all of them. A really good example of this I think is my kiddos where my oldest one had severe bloody stool, awful eczema, and cried all of the time. Um, whereas my second one had more upper GI responses. Her stools looked pretty good, but she vomited constantly and she did not sleep, reflux symptoms all of the time. Her skin was beautiful and pristine. Two very different, of course, because my second time around, I was like, oh, I've got this in the bag, right? Like, I've navigated this, you know, the hard stuff already. This will be so easy. Um, they never, never take you down the same journey. So just some examples of how, like, each will be different and the severity will be different. Okay. Okay. Now, in your experience, is there one allergy that presents itself more than another? Yeah. Um, not only in my experience, but also in published research, by and large, cow's milk protein right. is the number one trigger. And um, in all of the published research that we have and the um, IRB approved studies that we've done and grant studies that we've done too, we see that around 90% of wow. littles who have food reactivity react to cow's milk protein. Okay. And about half of those kiddos will have an additional trigger. So let's say cow's milk protein and soy or cow's milk protein and egg, for example. Okay. But by and large, cow's milk protein, like 90% of all reactivity, that's way that's the heck up there. So, um, that's why I think oftentimes parents are told out of the gate, like, cow's milk, take cow's milk protein out because it's very likely to be a trigger. Unfortunately for some of us, though, um, it's not the only okay. trigger. Right. So there is a potential correlation between having one allergy and then having a secondary allergy as well? Yes. Okay. Yep. So um, if you have, an, and especially for these kiddos with non-IG mediated food allergies, it's essentially the immune system just misidentifying a protein portion of a protein. So it's highly likely that if their little body and their immune system is misidentifying this little fragment of protein for something that's bad, right, uh, something that's a target, then it's absolutely going to do that for other types of people. Okay. So when a parent sees that their little one may be having some hives or some swelling, is the best thing to do just to say give baby some Benadryl and help calm that down or is there something as a parent that you can do in order to help mitigate those symptoms? Yeah so if, if you are suspecting that your little one has those IgE mediated food allergies so swelling in the hives um, highly recommend pushing for a referral to an allergist so you can get actual testing and you can be given an EpiPen. Um, it isn't uncommon for those types of food allergies, especially to escalate okay. the more times that you're exposed to that food. And so going and getting testing, um, one, confirming that can be so helpful to say like, oh, X, Y, and Z are the food allergens for this type of reaction. So helpful. Um, I wish and someday we'll be able to do that for the rest of us. Um, but you can get that. You can get an EpiPen. You can have a plan in place um, for those types of reactions. And um, oftentimes when our kiddos are really young too, we can go back and get retesting as well. Because okay. one thing that's important to know when we're talking about this type of testing is that the younger your child is, the less accurate that type of test is oh, because that immune system is continuously developing. Mm -hmm. So getting that testing as soon as you can is wonderful. And then also coming back and retesting. And I saw a little question in the comments Typically, so there are some allergists that I'm aware of that will test earlier, but more often than not, allergists typically will wait until your baby is at least six months old because of how inaccurate the test is under six months. Okay. Um, but some will test earlier with the plan of like, we're going to retest in three to six months because we are just going to assume that there's probably going to be some false positives and false negatives. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about the testing procedure? Because you know, when I grew up, the testing procedure for other allergens, say like a grass allergy or, you know, pollen, it was poking with needles. So some parents may think, oh, my baby's going to get poked with needles. Is that how they do the testing? Or is there a less invasive 
way <laughs> for those testing procedures to be done. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm very familiar um, as a kiddo who mm -hmm. was diagnosed back in the day um, as well. So, yes, the two different types of tests that are most commonly used is either a blood panel or a skin prick test. Okay. And so it's still a prick, but it is a very small little needle that is utilized, um, and it is in a very tiny portion, typically on their back. Um, the pros and cons between these is that with a blood um, panel, like getting your littles blood drawn, not a good right. happy fun time done that. Um, however, when they do that, then they can decide if they want to test for a whole, you know, panel of several foods and you're not getting like more pokes necessarily for mm -hmm. getting more food tested versus when you do a skin prick test. Um, one, typically the skin prick test is known to be a little more accurate for these kiddos which is something important to know. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can be uncomfortable because it is like some little skin pricks and the more things you test, the more pricks there has, has to occur, sure. right? So um, they're individual kind of tests, like here's where we're gonna test for this cow's milk protein, here's where we're gonna test for soy. Mm -hmm. um, another example of a test that can be done is called a patch test. Okay. Oftentimes that type of test is specifically for contact dermatitis reactions, so think, um, you know, you have a latex allergy, for example, that you react to, that may be a contact dermatitis situation. And that's um, a test that I've actually done with my oldest um, and have saved in my highlights under patch test too for anybody that's interested in that type of testing. Okay. So we have determined that baby does have a cow's milk allergy. Um, is the only thing for a parent to do just to switch to a formula or can mom still proceed on a breastfeeding journey? with feeding their little ones and what what does that look like yeah so absolutely parents can 100 percent continue breastfeeding if they choose if mm -hmm. they want to continue their lactating journey they can through food reactivity um essentially if we find that your baby has a cow's milk protein allergy the first step is typically removing cow's milk from your okay. diet and oftentimes a really common question that i'll get is like how strict do i need to be about eliminating cow's milk and usually Every baby is different as far as their sensitivity level, right? So um, what I mean by that is like, let's say you and I both have a cow's milk protein allergy, but I can tolerate when I have cow's milk baked down into a muffin because okay. I'm going to really break that protein down when I bake it versus you can't have even that version, right. even that unless it's you an allergic response. So each kiddo is going to be a little bit different. And so typically out of the gate, if we're gonna go dairy-free, we do so as strictly as we possibly can, removing all forms of dairy. And then once we reach a happy, healthy baby, also known as baseline in this community, once we reach happy, healthy baby, then we can go back and say like, okay, can I have baked dairy into mm -hmm. product, for example? It's easier to go that route, get to happy, healthy baby first and test backwards than it is to like, take it on a more slower approach, especially if you end up finding out that your baby has more than one trigger. Mm -hmm. um, so you absolutely can continue your breastfeeding journey. And if you want to switch to a formula, that's an option too. There are hydrolyzed and um, broken down formulas that um, most kiddos can tolerate. I will say there are some kiddos that um, struggle even with the really broken down elemental formulas. Mm -hmm. um, so. The other thing that's really important to know for these parents who may be in the middle of like, okay, I'm eliminating cow's milk protein from my diet. One of the really big sources of misinformation there of like the how, how to do that, mm -hmm. not only is, you know, how strict do I need to be about it, but how long right. do I need to do it? And so I think it's really important to um, discuss the science behind the, what's happening in these two different bodies. So on the parent side of things, if you're lactating and you're consuming cow's milk protein, when you consume a protein, and we have a lot of research behind this, when you consume a protein, it peaks in concentration a few hours after you eat it, mm -hmm. which makes total sense because that's what we see also in blood titers. When you're consuming a food, it's supposed to end up in your circulatory system and your breast milk's made out of blood. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna peak within a few hours in concentration and steadily plummet from there. Usually the protein is untraceable within eight hours and um, so usually we give about a 24 hour kind of grace period because there's gonna be outliers, right? Your metabolism will be different, your hydration will be different, all that fun stuff. Um, and important also to note that the number one thing that removes proteins from the breast is actual breast milk removal. Mm -hmm. So it's a little different from 
alcohol, where we know that cellular metabolism will remove the alcohol over time, whether we remove breast milk or not. Mm -hmm. Whereas things that we consume, like proteins, they follow a very similar trajectory for transfer and clearance, but you have to actually remove the breast milk itself. Um, as opposed to the cellular metabolism doing all the work. Although that would be great if it did all the work for us. Um, so that's what's happening on one side of the body, right? Like you're consuming, you're transferring, and then you're clearing a protein. The other side is I think part of what contributes to some of the confusion is that then you have baby consuming the protein and then you have to have a reaction and healing. And that's what can take a little bit more time. So for example, let's say I eat something today at lunchtime, I have a big bowl of ice cream, let's say. Um, and I'm sorry for anybody listening who's on a normal Asian diet. Um, so I have a big bowl of ice cream, it's gonna peak in concentration in my breast around two, three o'clock. I breastfeed around that time and that concentration starts to come down as I feed each time I feed. With that, with a non-IgE-mediated food allergy, the timing is different. Okay. So uh, you can have acute reactions, which happen quickly and heal quickly. Those are vomiting responses, those are hive responses, things like that. Or you can have a chronic reaction, which are reactions that take longer to happen and take longer to heal. Okay. So for example, the most common for kiddos is allergic proctitis, which is blood in stool okay. or diarrhea, mucusy stool. So, okay, I'm having my bowl of ice cream at noon. I breastfeed at three o'clock. That's when my baby is getting that protein. She's most likely to have that allergic response, that chronic blood in stool or mucus in stool diarrhea, um, six to eight hours after she's ingested. Okay. So that's what's going to take a little bit longer to occur. And then once she does have a reaction, the um, total length of time, so six to eight hours is like the sweet spot of most often when they have a reaction, but some kiddos aren't stooling every day. So okay. it may take, or they may be delayed. So they, it may take up to 48 hours for you to see the goods, right? You may have no idea that anything's happening because you haven't seen any diapers. Um, so we get 48 hours for that peak of response. And now if you have a, a diarrhea, mucusy stool, bloody stool, you have a literal wound in the gastrointestinal system, mm -hmm. right? Um, right? And that's gonna take time to heal. So it's not something where you cut cow's milk protein out of your diet and then baby's symptoms just immediately go away because it's out of your breast. It's that baby has to slowly heal and their gastrointestinal system has to close and heal and that inflammation has to go away. So typically what we, when we're working with parents, that's usually about a five day window. So a day for you to clear, up to two days for you to see the peak of reaction for baby, depending on timing, and then a couple of days for you to see impact. So within a five day window, you should see some form of improvement. And that may, be, may not be a brand new baby. For some, it is a brand new baby. I'm like, yay for that. Yeah. Um, so it may not be a brand new baby, but it should be like, oh yeah, I see significantly less blood mm -hmm. or baby's feeling much better. We're going in the right direction with color, all that fun stuff. <clears throat> and from there then, day over day, you should see significant improvement. And I think part of the confusion, with, especially with the Cosmo protein, is that because day over day, we're seeing that like steady improvement, in our minds and what we're told um, by some is then that means that it's because it's a slow improvement of cow's milk in your breast mm -hmm. when in reality it's just slow improvement of symptoms okay. and cow's milk protein hasn't been in your breast for a long long time and the reason why that's so important to share is that oftentimes then parents will be on uh, an elimination diet way longer than they need to um, they need to consider either that it's not food related or that there's a different or additional trigger. Um, that way the baby and the parent isn't suffering any longer than they have to. Because um, if you're getting worse past a five day window and you feel really confident that you've effectively removed cow's milk protein, mm -hmm. it's time to consider other possibilities. Okay. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that answers that question. It does, it definitely does. There's, you are just such a wealth of information. <laughs> Um, do you want to jump over to some of our questions that we have from our audience? Because I see yeah, some absolutely. awesome. Let's go ahead and ask this one. So if mother is avoiding lactose for the cow's milk, um, oh, is avoiding lactose enough or does milk need to be avoided more? So that's a great question and a common misconception as well. So when we're looking at any kind of milk, any kind of mammalian milk, 
but let's talk about cow's milk specifically. Um, there are three main components, right? Macronutrients. We have a carbohydrate, a fat, and a protein. Mm -hmm. And the carbohydrate that makes up cow's milk or any mammalian milk is lactose. So that's the carbohydrate. Lactose is not what infants react to. In fact, okay. breast milk contains more lactose in it than cow's milk protein does. Interesting. Than, than cow's milk itself does. So you taking lactose out of your diet actually doesn't do anything to the lactose concentrations in your breast. Okay. We naturally make lactose in our breast. We naturally make more of it than cows do. So going lactose free actually isn't helpful at all because the thing that the baby is reactive to is the proteins. Okay. And so there are a bunch of different proteins that make up cow's milk. And um, there are certain portions of these proteins that we transfer to the breast. That's what transfers to the breast, and that's what elicits an allergic response. So going all the way back to the beginning of the conversation when we started, and you were like, what's an allergen? Right. The allergen is that fragment of the protein, uh, that for food anyway, that's eliciting an allergic response, not a lactose. The lactose is the sugar, and when we have a lactose intolerance, like we talked about, you're missing an enzyme to break that down, but that's not infant's problem. So that's a huge struggle then if you're like, I went lactose free, what gives? Baby's not any better. It's because baby's not reactive to lactose, they're reactive to protein. Okay, I'm so glad that we were able to clarify that. All right. Oh, this is a good one. Does, let's see if I can get the whole thing on there. Does frequent eight to 10 day green poops and excessive gas reflux sound like a dairy issue? And it looks like mom has eliminated for her daughter, um, yes, so she has eliminated and her daughter now has yellow poops one to two times a day. Yay, wonderful. Okay, well, first of all, you're amazing and incredible and huge kudos. Um, yes, so when we're looking at um, symptomology for littles, um, frequency, anything more typically than eight times a day is considered diarrhea for a baby. Okay. Um, and that's important because it's actually totally normal for our babies when they're explicitly breastfed, especially to have a watery stool. Totally normal for them to have a watery stool. When we see watery stool, we're like, oh, that's yeah. diarrhea, right? Like that would be diarrhea for us. But for a baby, totally normal to see watery stool. It becomes concerning if it's more than eight times a day. Um, colors such as green can be concerning as well, depending on, there are some other things that can cause kind of a greenish stool, um, but that is a red flag. Certainly the discomfort is a red flag. And when you have effectively removed the right things at the same time, we very commonly see frequency go way, way down. And the reason is because in the gastrointestinal system, you're getting this big, big inflammation response, right? And so you're having diarrhea. It means that the baby's not able to properly absorb the nutrients out of your breast milk or whatever it is that you're feeding them. Um, and so you end up with stooling all day long. Um, you get this huge influx, and when they start properly absorbing and inflammation goes down, it stops being kind of like squeezed almost, if you will, like toothpaste style, give everybody an awful visual for the afternoon. Um, then you start to see the frequency drop dramatically. So frequency goes down, stool color gets better. It sounds like you maybe had a beautiful baseline, and that was likely your trigger, which is amazing, and you're a badass. Now we kind of did this question, but just to kind of recap, um, what are some food triggers for eczema and replacements for it? Yeah, um, so just like any other food reactivity, any food can be a trigger for eczema. Um, we have done research to look at which foods are most often triggers for infants, and we're in the middle of working on publication for that particular like list. I can tell you off the top of my head, um, dairy is right up there as number one again. Um, soy, eggs is another really common one. Peanuts is another very, very common one. And oftentimes we'll see that um, for kiddos who, not always, so I don't want to scare anybody, right. but for kiddos who we find later on in life have, let's say, like an IgE-mediated egg allergy, mm -hmm. we may see an eczema response through the breast to egg first and then later find out, oh, this was like a precursor to having an IG mediated egg allergy. So more research to happen there, but the short answer to that is, those are the foods most likely to elicit a response. And as far as like other things, um, it depends on what you're eliminating, right? And we have 
lots of resources there. We have a full cookbook that's top infant allergen free for parents if they um, need any assistance there. And um, depending on what it is that you're eliminating, we have stuff on the blog and all that stuff. You put in like what the food is up at the top of our blog search and stuff will come up for you. I promise. That's awesome. Okay, so we're over our half hour. Do you have time for a couple more questions? Yeah. Yep, I'm good. Okay, all right. Ooh, I like this one. I'm going to read it first and then I'll post it. Can a baby be allergic to mom's lactose? My baby could not breastfeed even after eliminating dairy. Now daughter drinks lactose-free milk just fine. Yep, so when, so two pieces. One, um, can baby be reactive to uh, lactose in our breast milk? Mm -hmm. Yes, technically we can have a, a congenital meaning like at birth, um, inability to produce the enzyme to properly break down lactose. That's very, very, very rare right. at birth and typically caught. So I would expect the symptoms to be very severe. Mm -hmm. um, it's, so can it happen? Yes, it can happen. Um, the other more often scenario that we see is that the kiddo when they were that young had an additional trigger like soy, for example, because Dairy protein, some of the dairy proteins, that fragment of protein almost looks identical to soy. Okay. And so the, ba the baby, if they react to one, very often reacts to the other. And so it's more often that we see that the kiddo is reacted to cow's milk protein and soy in our breast. So if we remove one, we don't see the alleviation of symptoms. Um, and then baby will outgrow. And we end up in a slew of other comorbidities like lactose intolerance down the road. Now, as I mentioned before, is it possible? It is. It is totally possible. So that might be the case for you. Um, more often than not, though, we're looking at more than one trigger with the breast. Okay. All right. Let's do one more question. I'm going to read this one again. My boy had infamil milk for the first time and immediately pooped blood. I stopped immediately pending delivery visit. Is that an allergic reaction sign? Yes, that is a common um, sign of what's called food protein induced allergic practicalitis um, or FPAP. It's a weird <laughs> acronym, it's not a great one. Yeah. Um, so, allergic practicalitis is like the shortest way to state that. Um, one of the interesting things that um, people can take away from this is that when you're seeing blood in stool, there are two basic categories depending on what the blood looks like. So for example, if the blood is very bright, mm -hmm. so um, if anybody's over on like our website and sees my journey, I have a picture of like my daughter's school that was just completely like crazy, it was just blood. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very bright. And for that type of response where the blood is very bright, it means that it hasn't had time to change its oxygenation status or the, that's a schnazzy word to say, scab, right? Mm -hmm. Like when, when blood um, scabs over. And so if you see it as very bright, then it's more likely allergic proctocolitis. If you see it and it's very dark, um, that means that the blood has had time to kind of scab over essentially. Mm -hmm. And in the stool, we'll see it as like flakes almost, um, or this like darker scab color. And that is FPE more often than not, uh, which just means the difference is that one happens in the large intestine and the colon, um, which is the allergic proctocolitis, and then one happens in the small intestine, a little bit higher up. Um, the other potential thing that we see as far as blood in stool can sometimes be if the parent is lactating and they have um, nipple damage, you may see that really dark blood because it's gone all the way through the gastrointestinal system and my condolences to your nipples um, and definitely see a professional for help on that. Um, and so sometimes we'll see blood with that. The other time that we see blood more often than not is an anal fissure where the baby is really pushing really hard. And so with the blood, we'll see um, that the stool otherwise looks perfect, right? The stool looks really great, looks wonderful, but there's like some little specks or a little bitty creeps of very bright red blood. Um, and so in that case, it's a matter of like looking at, are there any other symptoms? What does the stool look like otherwise? Uh, but if you did the, that specific formula, saw that specific reaction, it's very likely that there is an ingredient or one or more ingredient in there that elicited that response. Okay. And it's a non -IGM, likely a non-IGM-mediated food allergy that's likely to be outgrown. Okay. All right, we'll do one more question. Okay. 
when is it safe for reintroduction of dairy into mom's diet? Yeah. Uh, oh man. Um, so I like to uh, break reintroduction is kind of the, the term that we like to use for that. Mm -hmm. of like, okay, we're going to bring dairy or whatever the food is back into our lives or baby's lives or both. Um, when we are going to do a reintroduction strategy, I break them up into two categories. The first is either a confirmation trial or a um, trigger reintroduction. So a confirmation reintroduction is like, I removed seven things from my diet because I didn't know what it was and the symptoms were really bad. And like, I'm just going to throw it at the wall and see what's yeah. Um, Been there. And <laughs> we need to do a confirmation trial. So in my first journey, I didn't bring foods back because I was terrified mm -hmm. and I didn't have any support. And so I just stayed like that for a year and I billion percent do not recommend other people do that. Part of the reason why free to feed exists. Mm -hmm. And so instead we do a confirmation trial where we say, okay, these are the seven things we removed. Baby's at baseline. Hallelujah. That's amazing. Now let's work on bringing each of these things back one at a time in a very specific confirmation trial to say, oh, there it is. Baby's actually reacted to dairy and rice. That's silly, but wonderful. We now can eat the rest of these foods um, so that you can have a sustainable diet long term and that you know what baby's reacted to before you start solids because then you're not going to start with a rice cereal if you right. know that rice is the trigger. So that's a confirmation trial um, because I don't subscribe to the thought process of eliminate something forever and ever for funsies because it's not fun. Um, and even if you only, I hate that word, but even if you remove cow's milk protein and you get to baseline, for many of us, it's, it's still very valuable to do a confirmation trial so that one, we feel like we're not crazy, like, yes, mm -hmm. this is for real, this is a thing. Um, and two, we know how significant or severe the level of sensitivity is, right? Can I have baked, for mm -hmm. example, right? What form can I have this in? So that's a confirmation reintroduction. A trigger reintroduction, so if baby has a non ig mediated food allergy, any of those symptoms we originally talked about, not the life-threatening style. That's working with an allergist in office, all that fun stuff. For these types of food allergies for infants, more often than not, the literature recommends that we strictly avoid the trigger food once we've confirmed it mm -hmm. for six months. Okay. Now, a couple of things that are important to note there is that the reason why six months is because it gives baby's immune system time to continue developing without continuously seeing the trigger. Right, and right. solidifying that association of like, you are a bad thing, and I'm gonna keep reacting to you. Mm -hmm. So it increases the likelihood they're, they're going to outgrow and reduces the amount of time it takes for them to outgrow that trigger. That's the first reason. The second reason is because that way baby's not just continuously reactive, right? So we're not just bringing the food back every couple of weeks just to see again and again and again, where baby's immune system is just up here all of the right. time. So we give them time. Um, the other caveat that I'll say to that, though, is like nothing magical is happening right at six months, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the food allergy theory isn't coming down and bopping them on the head at six months, right. post elimination, and like, boom, it's all done. Yep, um, it's, yeah, all better. Congratulations. Um, it's a general guideline. Some will end up doing it earlier because baby starts crawling and they go steal their, you know, sister's biscuit or whatever. Right. Life happens. Um, or you consume something, you get dairied at Starbucks, whatever it may be, um, know that life happens. That's a general guideline is typically six months. Okay. All right. Is there anything else you would like to say? And how can our audience get in contact with you? Yeah, um, I would say, man, one of the like biggest uh, announcements that I love to share is that we are um, accepting insurance now. So that's huge. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, Free to Feed offers personal consultations, one-on-one -on -one consultations with um, food allergy experts. And we have a team of pediatricians, lactation consultants, registered dietitians, registered nurses. They're amazing. And they're food allergy parents like myself. Um, and we recently have partnered with another organization that helps us take insurance with our IBCLCs. Awesome. And so over the moon about like accessibility. If um, you want to check that out, it's at freetofeed.com slash consults. The consults are available to everyone, but I wanted to share like, yeah, That's we're taking insurance now. It's exciting. Um, and then the other exciting piece is that we just recently got a National Science Foundation grant, and uh, which is huge. So we're officially funded by uh, the National Science Foundation and 
we are going to be launching our very first human factor study for a test kit in just a few months. So um, yeah, just like my wildest dreams over the last five years of this journey starting to come to fruition and we're gonna have test kits in hands this year. So um, if anybody wants to learn more about that, run over, check us out. Um, send me a message if you have any questions. I run our Instagram account, so you will be talking to me. If you wanna send me diaper pictures, here for it. If you have questions, uh, reach out. You're not alone. I just wanna say from the bottom of my heart, wherever you are in your journey today, you're doing an amazing job. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being live with us. Um, I'll be reaching out to a few of you for some prizes. And um, again, Dr. Trill's account is free to feed. I'll be tagging it in the comments of this and we will catch you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.